So the first presenter today is Dr. Smitya Bhatia. Smitya Bhatia, I hope I got that right, Smitya. Sorry if I didn't. Who is uh, at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, the cancer center there. She is one of the real early people who has looked at thrivership issues. She's done a great deal of research. She runs the Institute for Cancer Outcomes and Survivorship there at UAB. And she has been funded continually by the NIH since the year 2000. She is past, passionate about this research. She is a mentor to junior investigators. So please join me in uh, listening to Dr. Bhatia. Um, my absolute gratitude to V Foundation for funding this research. And what I want to do today is to spend the next eight to nine minutes in describing some of our early findings in um, understanding what are the molecular underpinnings of anthracycline-related heart failure in children who have survived and thrived after cancer. So in terms of cardiotoxicity in cancer survivors, cardiomyopathy or weakness of the heart muscles is the most common, and it irreversibly leads to heart failure. The most common risk factor is anthracycline chemotherapy, and other factors which modify this association or accelerate this association are radiation to the chest, a very young age at exposure, and then female sex. This, slide, this uh, particular graph shows the relationship between anthracycline dose on the x-axis and the risk of developing heart failure on the y-axis. And what it shows is that as the dose increases, and especially as it increases above 200 to 250 milligrams per meter squared, the risk of developing heart failure increases exponentially. An important thing also to note is that once heart failure sets in in our childhood cancer survivors, the five-year survival is quite low, so the prognosis is low, is poor. Another important thing to remember is that there is significant inter-individual variability in the risk of anthracycline-related cardiomyopathy, such that if you were to look at these green dots, each of them represents a case, and they are aligned with the dose of anthracyclines. And if you were cut to cut the dose of anthracyclines at 250 milligrams per meter squared, you would find that a large number of these patients developed heart failure at a much lower dose of anthracyclines. On the other hand, if you were to take childhood cancer survivors who also received anthracyclines and were to see, um, and they did not develop um, heart failure, you find that a lot of them received a fairly large dose of anthracyclines and escaped that heart failure. And this brings up the question about the role for genetic susceptibility. Now, within the children's oncology group, we've developed a study and carried it out now for over 15 years, where we identify individuals or childhood cancer survivors who've developed the cardiomyopathy or heart failure, and we match them to controls or childhood cancer survivors who've not developed heart failure. We ask them to provide us with DNA, um, either in the form of blood or saliva, and ask them to complete a short questionnaire describing other conditions, health conditions that they might have. We also ask the institutions to provide us with all the details of the treatments that these children might have received. We ask the sites to also provide us with echocardiogram reports in order to describe the heart failure that these patients have. And so far, we have close to about 200 cases of heart failure and 400 controls. And this is from 141 participating sites. Now, these patients, um, the median age, the age at cancer diagnosis, roughly seven and a half years. Those who developed heart failure had a much higher dose of anthracyclines as compared to those who didn't. And when you were to look at their echocardiogram report, you find that this indeed did have a suppression of their heart function. This is just a schematic of what we think 
happens when anthracyclines are given. Higher doses of anthracyclines first have to be transported across the cell, and then they undergo a series of metabolisms and result in the formation of products that can increase what are called reactive oxygen species, toxic substances that cause mitochondria to not function well in the cells. This leads to the heart muscle cell death or apoptosis, um, leads to um, the, the remodeling, which is not very well uh, structured and, and doesn't uh, work well, and then eventually leads to heart failure. Um, also, we have to know that one of these products out here of the anthracycline metabolism is directly um, cardiotoxic to the heart muscle cell. Now, what we've also done with respect to research, we and others have shown is that there's a bunch of genes that are controlling the function of, say, the drug transport, preventing or enhancing the anthracyclines from crossing that um, barrier, the cell barrier, the cell membrane, um, responsible for metabolism here and here, um, directly serving as antioxidants and reducing this toxic reactive oxygen species, and then um, working on the iron homeostasis, the iron metabolism, and then preventing, preventing heart failure, and also finally uh, working on the heart muscle contractility and preventing heart failure. Um, what we've also done is looked at the function of these genes, and time precludes me from showing the details, but really shown that if you have a high amount of enzyme, which produces a large amount of this toxic metabolite, that it places the patient at high risk of heart failure. If you have low levels of this antioxidant um, activity, hyaluronic acid molecule, it results in high levels of this reactive oxygen species and causes heart failure. And then if there is this particular polymorphism in the gene, it results in decreased myocardial contractility. Now, if we were to take this particular schematic and work our way through, let me just explain this, how this would work. So in our um, cells, we have our, our brain, the DNA. It undergoes replication on a regular basis but it also results in the formation of RNA and then eventually in the formation of proteins. And the proteins are our building box and also the, the entities that ensure that all of our bodies function the way we want it to function. Now we have and others have identified more than 100 genomic variants associated with heart failure, but we really do not understand fully how these work. It could be that some of these genomic variants don't themselves produce the protein or result in the production of protein, but work indirectly to enhance some RNA functions and then result in formation of other proteins, which is not directly obvious to us. And so the important question to be asked is, is gene expression controlling who gets heart failure and who doesn't? And we know that gene expression is strongly heritable, and we know that there's a technique which is cutting edge right now, RNA-seq, which allows messenger RNA levels to be quantified. And what we are doing as a result of the V Foundation funding is to measure the gene expression levels in cases and controls and see whether they are differentially expressed um, and then help us to use these differentially expressed genes to go back to the DNA and learn more about the mechanism of how heart failure develops. So our hypothesis is that perturbations in these gene expression will lead to identification of novel and functionally relevant genetic abnormalities in individuals or childhood cancer survivors who develop anthracycline-related cardiomyopathy, and this will help us understand the mechanisms of cardiotoxicity. And so first of all, we want to identify these transcriptomic signals or our um, gene expression levels, but then we want to take this information back to uh, human-induced 
pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes, as well as the human myocardium, as well as the human liver tissue, and to truly understand exactly what's going on with these genetic variants. The patients that we've studied so far are about eight to nine years old at the time of diagnosis of their cancer. Those who developed heart failure received higher doses of anthracycline and were more likely to have received chest radiation. They had acute lymphoblastic leukemia, bone sarcoma, or Hodgkin lymphoma. They were more likely to have diabetes, hypertension, or lipid problems. And they developed their heart failure about five, um, about five years out from diagnosis. And this slide shows a network of those RNA genes that we have thus far identified. And so what, just to orient you, it means the bright red genes are the ones that are upregulated, meaning the gene expression is increased. Lighter pink, it means it's less increased. And green means that they are downregulated, meaning that they're not expressed as much. So let's focus on this particular gene called haptoglobin. And here is a figure of our uh, haptoglobin gene in cases, the red bars, and green bars being the controls. And what we find is that amongst our cases, the read count of these expressions is increased as compared to the controls. And how does this particular haptoglobin work? It's an acute phase protein, which means it is very important for eliminating free hemoglobin, which causes oxidative damage. Individuals who have a genetic variant of this particular haptoglobin are at higher risk for developing cardiovascular disease, such as myocardial infarction, stroke, and heart failure in the general population, not in the cancer survivors so far. And haptoglobin is a risk factor for developing hypertension. So this is a particular new entity that we are, have identified so far. Another one is a gene called FCGR1B. And here again, we show you an overrepresentation or overexpression of this particular gene in cases and lower expression in controls. And this particular gene encodes a protein that plays an important role in immune response. It's associated with inflammation, such that resulting in atherosclerosis, acute myocardial infarction, and hypertension. In fact, in breast cancer patients, um, this particular gene serves as a pre-symptomatic biomarker um, in those who haven't yet fully developed the signs and symptoms of heart failure. Um, so this is where these particular new genes that we've identified would fit in in this schematic. And what I want to tell you is the next steps, wrapping up, showing that there are several other leads that we are going after now, and then moving on with our next step will be to look at the functional relevance of these genes that we identify. Why are we doing these studies? We really want to understand the underlying mechanisms for cardiotoxicity and develop effective treatments. We want to identify patients at highest as well as at lowest risk for developing cardiomyopathy, and this would help us provide personalized treatment to our patients. And eventually, our goal is to reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with anthracycline-related heart failure and thus allow our cancer survivors to thrive. I want to end by thanking the V Foundation, but also our patients and their families. Um, without them, this work would not have been possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, let me just put this back on. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia. We appreciate it and that's very helpful. And all of your research over time has just been so uh, meaningful and leads the way for so many of us in understanding better how we can help people who've been through the cancer journey who come out the other side thriving the way Scott so aptly described it for us. So thank you very much.